in April of 2021, my family and I uh, came up here to um, spend eight or nine days in Moses Lake and to be a potential candidate to be the pastor here of our church. And how it worked then is uh, my wife and Luke and I, we flew up from California to Seattle and my mom wanted to come and be with us and help watch Luke. So she flew down from Alaska and we met in the Seattle airport and we proceeded to rent a car in Seattle and we're gonna drive over here. That way we could have our own transportation and kind of cruise around when we needed it. And so once we uh, got to Seattle, we got the, the rental car we loaded up the car seat and we all got in and the young man that was about 18 years old or 19, at least he looked, handed me the keys to this new rental car in 2021. A lot of the rental car companies had gotten rid of their entire fleets in 2020 during the pandemic and they had all brand new cars in 2021. So he gave me the keys for this car and there was no key on the key, right? But I'd seen these before, you press a little button and the key flies out the side. So I wasn't alarmed until we all got in the car and I pull out the key and there's no key actually in the plastic key. So I waved down the young man and I popped my head out and I said, how do I start this thing? He says, there's a push button right there. And he takes off. So I start pressing the button and the car won't start. So I go get him again. He goes, oh, you gotta push your foot on the brake and then press the button. Like, okay, that kind of makes sense like most cars. And he takes off again and as I push my foot on the, the brake and I push the button, this digital dash illuminates but there's no physical tachometer that tells me the revolutions per minute. So I don't even know if the car is running at this point. <laughs> so instead of facing the embarrassment of asking a young man for advice again, I did the scientific method of walking up to the front of the car, putting my ear on the bumper, and I could hear it running, and we were finally ready to go. It took Dad longer to get the car started and in gear than it did for us to load up all the car seats and everything with the three-year-old and a whole family. And I tell you that goofy story about how, because how we operate as Christians in America is changing. See, I'm used to a manual five-speed transmission in a pickup truck that has no power locks, no power windows, no Bluetooth. That's what I'm used to. But getting in that new technology-enhanced car was a big change for me. And there are changes that we're learning and having to face as we interact as Christians in American culture and in our city of Moses Lake. We're having to learn to navigate this new dangerous world and this new culture that we find ourselves in. A culture where a football coach that wants to go to the middle of the field and, and pray after a football game is no longer admired as a man of faith, but instead he, instead he is questioned as someone that's trying to manipulate young minds. Or a guy that works as a mail carrier for USPS that had always enjoyed Sundays off because there was no mail delivered on Sundays. But when the USPS began delivering mail on Sundays for Amazon, he was told he either needed to quit voluntarily or he would be fired for asking to have Sundays off to worship God with his family. Because according to the courts, they said that caused a quote, undue hardship unquote, to the USPS. Those are just two examples, real life examples. One was in Bremerton, Washington. The other one was in Pennsylvania. Of this new world that we find ourselves living in and some of the challenges that we face as Christians alive right now. And it relates to these things that Peter is writing to the believers in First Peter. He's writing to these people in five different areas in Asia Minor, and he calls them in chapter 1, these believers, he calls them aliens in chapter 1, verse 1, and he calls them strangers and aliens in chapter 2, verse 11. Two phrases we almost feel like we can relate to as we live in our culture today as committed believers and followers of Jesus. So today we're in this section of 1 Peter, this second section of 1 Peter, from chapter 2, verse 11 to chapter 3, verse 12 that we're going to end today. A section where Peter is describing life 
in society? What are our duties as believers living in society? He's talked about our submission to governmental authorities. He's talked about our submission to our workplace bosses. He's talked about the relationship between a husband and wife and marriage. And now he's going to talk about submission within the church body and how it relates to the culture that the church interacts with. He's going to describe the mental attitude we should have here in verses 8 and 9, the method of our actions in verses 10 and 11, and then motivation for this behavior, lastly, in verse 12. And Peter describes this mental attitude that we should have as believers in verses 8 and 9. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. Now, Peter here, he wants to summarize all of those things that he has been describing, those three or four categories of submission that he has been describing for us. And he says that here to sum up, at least in the translation I'm using, the New American Standard Bible. If you have the, the NIV, which is a good translation, they translate it simply as finally. He's trying to bring everything to a kind of a climax and a, a conclusion, and he wants to make sure we don't miss the points he's making. And he describes first these five adjectives in verse 8, these thinking or feeling adjectives. These are possibly what we're supposed to have in the internal Christian community. They are positive things as a Christian community that we should have as part of our lives. That first adjective he describes, he says, all of you be harmonious. That word for be harmonious is a combination of two Greek words. One means same or common. The other word means sympathy. So have sympathy together. Be like-minded. Be united in spirit, he tells them. Then he also tells them the second adjective, to be sympathetic to one another. That word describes understanding that we should have, that we should share feelings with others when they're going through difficult times or, or have emotions. He also tells them to be brotherly there. That's the third adjective in verse 8 be brotherly toward one another. It's similar to what he's already told them in chapter 1, verse 22, where he said, since you have obedience to the truth, you've purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart, he says. There he's describing this familial love that they have, but also an intentional sacrificial love that the brethren, the brothers and sisters, should have for each other in the community. The fourth adjective, he says, is to be kind-hearted toward one another. That word describes tender feelings for someone, to be tender-hearted or compassionate. It's, the same, it's a word that's only used in one other place. It's used by Paul in chapter 4, verse 32. Whenever I had trouble... Uh, getting along with others, I had a guy that mentored and discipled me for many years. This was a verse he often would ask me if I had memorized. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ also has forgiven you. And the last adjective there, the last thinking or feeling adjective he describes for them, he says, Be humble in spirit. In verse 8. The best way to describe this one, I think, is a, a story from when I was in college for a couple semesters. I worked as a referee for an intramural um, sports league in our school. So staff could play these sports, or alumni could play these sports, or even students could play these sports. We had dodgeball, volleyball, softball, and I was a referee for those, as well as for flag football. It was four-on-four four flag football, and often it would be alumni that still lived in the city that would sign up and play for these leagues. And every semester, there was one team that always won flag football. Their name was called No Way Jose. It was four Hispanic guys 
They seemed old to me because I was 18. They were probably only about 35 or 40. But these guys, No Way Jose, would win every single year. A bunch of five foot six Hispanic guys that weren't super athletic. Their star player was even a little kind of pudgy and a little round. But these guys were humble. They worked as a team. They knew how to win. And it was always interesting because the other 18 or 19 year old kids are trying to throw the ball deep and they're yelling that I was open and why don't you throw it to me? These guys, they were humble. They knew their strengths. They never threw the ball. They just did run plays. That's what it means to be humble in spirit, to yield to others and, and to know what our strengths and weaknesses are. See, what Peter is telling these people is they need to seek unity even amongst their diversity that they have. See, the church is not directed to uniformity where everyone looks the same. The church is not directed to unanimity where we all 100% have to agree. But instead, we should have cooperation amongst diversity. That's what it means to have unity. Kind of like an orchestra, if you've ever listened to a beautiful orchestra and symphony in a concert, right? There might be 50 people on the stage, but they often have maybe 10 different instruments. And those instruments are all doing different things. They're playing notes high or low or at different times. They do many different things and in different ways, but they come together to make a beautiful piece of music. And that's what the church should have. Where diversity manifests itself as unity, there becomes beauty in a church, and that's what it should look like for us. So verse 8 describes these thinking or feeling adjectives, but then in verse 9, he gives them a little bit of a doing that they need to follow. In verse 9, Peter says, Not returning evil for evil, or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you are called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. Now, while verse 8 seems to imply to the Christian community, possibly inwardly, in a positive way, this statement in verse 9, these doing things can apply to the inward Christian community, but most likely is going to reflect outside people that criticize a believing body of Christians. And when Peter says, not returning evil for evil, or insult for insult, that's naturally what we do, right? If someone punches us, our first response is to punch them back. No one has to teach us that. If someone insults us verbally, we instantly want to give it right back to them verbally. But Christians are supposed to be different. And it's interesting how Peter is the one to describe this non-retaliatory behavior Right? Because when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and this army of soldiers shows up to arrest him, who was that guy that pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of one of those men there to arrest Jesus? It was Peter. Peter is trying to follow what Jesus has said in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. Jesus said, But I say to you here, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. One of the reasons we believe this letter written by this guy named Peter is the same Peter that walked with Jesus, because there's 32 different kind of echoes that Peter has of Jesus' teachings in the Gospels, and that's one of them where he doesn't quote Jesus directly, but he is echoing the same things that Jesus has said. 32 times in this little letter, he has similar echoes just like that. And the one here is that we don't return evil with evil. We don't return an insult with an insult. Instead, we seek forgiveness as believers instead of vengeance. We seek forgiveness instead of vengeance. See, when someone treats us poorly as a Christian, we have three things that we can do when we respond. Three things that we should do. One is to pray compassionately for that person. Right? Pray for them and pray to God on their behalf. God, I don't know what's going on with that dude, but he needs a little extra attention and help from you. The second thing we do is we treat him or her kindly to try to do or say something nice. 
And third, we forgive fully. And forgiveness is a complex thing because it's not just like a stamp we can declare and then move on. Sometimes it takes days or weeks or months or years to forgive people. But how do we do these difficult things that Peter is describing in verses 8 and 9? Peter quotes from the Old Testament describing this method, this, these reasons for why we do that and help for us to know how to do that. In verses 10 and 11, Peter writes, For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Now, in my translation there, he begins verse 10 with the word for. That's giving the reasoning or the explanation and and the support for what he's just said in verses 8 and 9. And what he does, Peter does, is he quotes from Psalm 34 to support what he said in verses 8 and 9. Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16, are the verses that Peter quotes. And that psalm was written by King David during the circumstances that he was encountering when David was anointed to be king of Israel, but there was about a 15-year gap between when Samuel anoints David to be king and when he actually becomes king. And if you've read through the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, there are some interesting times when King Saul was hunting David and trying to kill David and murder David. And in one of those times, Saul's persecution of David became so strong that David traveled into the Philistine territory. He enters into their army camp, trying to seek shelter from Saul. And when the king there, King Achish, discovers David, David pretends to, to drool and pretends to be this madman in front of the king. That's the context that David writes this psalm that Peter quotes. And Peter quotes the objective of our behavior there in verse 10 at the beginning. He says, the one who desires life to love and see good days. See, as Christians, we're, we're here today because we desire peace in our life. We, we look to God for contentment and peace. We want to follow God and we love him and we seek to obey him. That's why we gather together each week as a church. We know our good days are things that God provides for us as we look to him. Then Peter quotes from that psalm a section that says, you know, prevent this. The two things to stay away from. The first is that we need to restrain and tame our tongue in verse 10. He says, the one who desires good days to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. See, the problem with us, if we get insulted or we are done evil to or we are harmed, our natural response is to use our lips to fight back. And our tongues and our lips can cause harm if we're not careful. James chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, describes the power of our tongues. He says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. James quotes. Now, our tongues can do damage if we don't monitor them. When we get sarcastic or spicy or the words we use now, or you're being kind of salty in how you talk to me or sassy. See, tremendous damage can be done with our lips because we cannot erase the things that we say verbally, and we can't take back the things that we type out in an email or a text message or anything like that. That's why Peter tells us we need to restrain and tame our tongues. The Bible teacher J. Vernon McGee 
who passed away in the 90s, he tells a story about how when his dad died, he went to go live with his two aunts and his unsaved uncle. And they would go to church every Sunday. The uncle was not a Christian and he was an alcoholic. So one aunt would go to the Baptist church. One aunt would go to the Presbyterian church. Then they would come back after church and it was gossip session between the two aunts. And the uncle always heard it. And he said years later, one of the aunts asked him, why do you think our, your uncle has never been a believer? And J. Vernon McGee said he didn't know how to describe it to his aunt. But he believed, you know, the, the uncle heard a lot more gossip than he ever heard the gospel from those ladies, those two aunts. And that's a shame when we gossip more than we share the gospel with others. We need to restrain and tame our tongues, especially when people, people speak ill of us or insult us. A second thing that Peter says to prevent here is to resist and turn from evil. He says this person who desires the good life must turn away from evil, right? These talk about the deeds. The words usually come first, but if we speak evil words, usually deeds follow closely after. So we need to resist and turn from evil. But then Peter finishes here. He talks about how we need to prevent this, tame the tongue, but we also need to pursue this. He says, do good in verse 11 there. Do good. When we turn away from our evil temptations and deeds, we naturally need to turn toward good deeds and do good things. Whether it's the moment we become a Christian from when we were unsaved, or maybe it's 10 years later as we are continuing to grow in our Christian life. That's a constant thing, turning away from evil toward good. Peter also says we must seek peace. Now, he says seek peace because it's more of our nature to fight and argue and push back against others. But seeking peace usually takes a little more conscious, intentional effort from us. And lastly, Peter says he must pursue it. The Christian, the believer in God, must pursue that peace. Sometimes Christians, we're known better for being able to find the phone number of an attorney faster than we are known for being able to find scripture or find the phone number for the person that has wronged us so we can work out that peace. Peter's telling us that we need to do good at every opportunity and we need to seek peace at all times. Do good and seek peace. And doing good can be simple things, trying to meet the needs of others, being a good listener, in our family, my wife likes to keep granola bars in her car so that if someone is asking for money or food on the side of the road, she pulls out a granola bar and gives it to the person, always seeking to do good. There was a time in our marriage where we were a little tight on money and we talked about trying to save money and I saw a homeless individual on the corner where we were going to stop to turn right and she had a banana in her hand because Luke didn't want the banana and she goes, should we give the banana to the homeless guy? And I punched the gas and we whipped around the corner before we could stop because <laughs> I was thinking we're tight on money we can't give a banana and she casually said it's kind of hard to give them the banana when you blow through the red light <laughs> so even little things always be trying to do good even if you're struggling with money and you're tight try to do good okay but also seek peace, right? Peace should be our first option. It's not always possible. Peace isn't always the result that we end up with, but it should be our desire to seek peace. In 1938, Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of England, traveled east over into Europe to meet with one of the new leaders that was very strong and becoming very famous. He returned in 1938, he got off the airplane and it was raining, even though it was raining, there was a group of photographers there and, and people with video cameras and he held up this piece of paper and he's waving it in the rain saying, I have secured peace for our time, was what Neville Chamberlain said. He says, I have secured peace and this is gonna keep us at peace. I have got a signature from Adolf Hitler, he said. Now that didn't work out as we know 
He eventually got removed from office and replaced, but that was his initial desire. That was his initial attempt was to seek peace. At least we know it wasn't personal because Adolf Hitler signed something with Stalin and disregarded that too. So it was kind of, he signed peace deals with everybody and violated them. But we have to at least admire his desire to, to seek peace at first. And most historians will say that if England or other allies tried to take on Germany at that time, we would never have won that war against them. Hitler and Nazi Germany were way too strong in 1938. And if we would have went to war at that time, we would have lost. But since we waited a few years later, other allies grew. Nazi Germany got spread on too many war fronts and they were weaker. And eventually we were able to, to win that war. See, seeking peace should always be our first option, even if it doesn't end that way. And if we seek peace like God wants us to, God will honor that process and use it. So how do we seek peace? What are those steps? I don't usually give a lot of lists in my sermons, but there are two today. How do we seek peace? Five basic steps for seeking peace. Simple reminders to help us. One, try to talk in person with the person. Try to talk face to face. We're usually much nicer if we have to look someone in the eye to say something difficult. So talk in person. Second, don't ascribe intentions. Don't say what you think they meant to do or say. Don't ascribe what they intended to accomplish. Third, ask questions. Ask open-ended questions of the person that has caused harm or raised difficulties. Fourth, share your feelings. When you did that, I felt this way. When you said that, it caused me to feel this. It's okay to share your feelings. And fifth, express your desire for peace. Okay. And last, verse 12, we see this motivation for all of these difficult behaviors that Peter is telling us to have. Verse 12, he says, For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now here when Peter quotes from David, when it talks about the eyes of the Lord and the ears of the Lord and the face of the Lord, God does not literally have eyes, ears, and a face. This is what's called anthropomorphic language, where an author uses human characteristics and describes them about God in a way that we can understand what God is like and who he is. In this case, the eyes of God describe that he sees everything is done. The ears of God describes how he hears what is going on. He knows those things. And in that way, God attends to the prayer of the righteous, but his face turns against those who do evil. See, God responds to the righteous, and he ignores the disobedient. And this raises a common question, you know, does God answer the prayers of unbelievers? Does God listen to and answer the prayers of people that do not know him and do not follow him? Well, first, we know that God is omnipresent and omniscient. He knows everything. So he hears everybody's prayers, whether they're a Christian or non-Christian. He hears and knows all things, right? But I don't think God says no to someone just because they're unbeliever. You know, this guy's a believer, I'll say yes. This guy's not a believer, no. I don't think it's quite that simple. But God does sometimes consider the relationship that people have with him as he hears their prayers. For example, in the Old Testament, there are numerous times where God says, you are doing these things, you are offering these sacrifices, but you're disobeying my word in all these other areas, so I'm not going to pay attention to your sacrifices. Your heart is hardened, and because of that, I'm not going to listen to what you request. But we know from 1 John that God does answer prayers if they are in accordance with his will. So even if an unbeliever is praying something that follows God's will, it seems like he is going to answer those prayers. And that's a difficult, I know that's a difficult question. And if you have unchristian friends and people that are trying to seek God or understand God, that's usually going to be one of their questions they have. Does God hear my prayers if I'm not following him? 
because they're more likely to probably pray to God before they've placed their faith in God. But at least here, in what David says and in what Peter is quoting, it appears that those who are hard-hearted and disobedient to God, that God turns his face from them. Meanwhile, he focuses on the needs and attending to the prayers of the righteous. Peter's words here describe some tough things for us to do. He talks about seeking harmony with us as a Christian body on the inside. He talks about pursuing peace with each other in the church, but also with others outside of the church. He talks about how we need to guard our lips from speaking evil. He talks about how we need to guard our hands from doing evil in our actions. And those are important because those are what create harmony for us as a local church in a disarray world. Then the harmony starts with us, that we need to be united and together as a church body. In a culture that becomes less and less accepting of what we do and what we say, that's becoming less and less tolerant of us, it's more and more important for us to be united as a local church on the things that we believe and the things that we do. We need to be stronger and stronger as a local church individually here, as a church regionally in our city and community, as a church nationally and globally. We need to make sure that, you know, our house is in order, that our house is strong by building harmony and, and unity amongst our diversity so that when the winds of culture and the difficulties of culture blow against the church of God, that we are able to withstand those winds. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your, your way that you speak to us in unique ways, how you present certain topics at certain times when you know we need to hear them, and you do that as we faithfully look at your word each week. I pray for our church that you would continue the harmony that we already have in a way we are we're a good model of this i believe for other churches i pray that that would continue i pray that you would point out to us the reasons that that has occurred and that you would allow us to be a good example for other churches and and to bring other churches along with that attitude of submission that we have towards each other in our body and the loving and compassionate attitudes that we have towards each other and as we go about the world, Lord, in jobs or community groups or school, whatever that might look like, I pray that you would give us strength to guard our tongues and watch our deeds so that we don't return insult and evil when it's done to us. Show us how to be peacemakers with the people we interact with and, and the people that we work with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.